I have dedicated my professional career to the study and control of arthropods. Okay, for the first part of this, I'd like to um, kind of introduce some terms for a lot of you. I know this will be old. I mean, it's a rehash of what you've already already know. Um, but I thought, you know, to it, other people may not be may may be interested in the subject, but may not have um, some of the background knowledge. So I'm going to try to catch everybody up to speed on what I'm talking about. So I want to start with this concept of sexual selection because in reality, um, I'll. This book right here, uh, by Charles Darwin. Let's see, I'll hold this up here. The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. This is the book that started it all off. Well, at least uh, as far as I can, as far as I know, this book started it all. Um, I, I, I love this book. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Um, it's actually more interesting reading than Origin. Um, and if you read it really carefully, um, I'd recommend getting a, this is a, this is actually an antique copy, a second edition. Um, but if you, you know, get, get an old paperback copy from a used bookstore so you can mark it up. Um, and one of the things you note in there is that Darwin really, his brilliance comes through in everything he writes, um. But one of the things that I've, I love to find and see in there is that he hits a lot of concepts that weren't recognized during his lifetime. And, you know, later on, 100 years later, they were rediscovered, um, fleshed out, studied, published. But when you read Darwin's original, you say, that sounds a whole lot like kin selection. That sounds a whole lot... I mean, some of these other concepts. And I'll... I'll you, talk explain some of these terms as I go through this series um, so sorry I keep looking over to keep track of time uh, so one of the things okay this term sexual selection Darwin coined the term um, selection in relation to sex um, Darwin looked saw sexual selection as a separate entity from natural selection related directly related um, but somewhat separate and uh, I think that he's been his concept of that's been borne out, but it's really interesting. Is that uh, if if any of you are familiar with the history of um, of Darwin and uh, his his concepts, you know, natural selection in the scientific community was readily accepted. I mean, it was sort of the the missing piece of a puzzle that people have been wondering over for a hundred years before Darwin's time. Um, sexual selection, however, was met. A whole lot more skeptically, um, and I not it, it it it's there's still some debatable aspects of it today, um, but one of the interesting th I'm gonna this is the term here. I wish I I could throw up uh, uh, note things because it'd be awesome if I could introduce those during this. Um, but Tar Darwin coined two separate terms. He he envisioned that sexual selection was in two separate realms of it, um, both under the same umbrella term. One is uh, intrasexual selection. Intrasexual selection was competition for mates. I should have defined the first. Well, I'll get back to that. Anyway, competition for mates um, between members of the same sex. In other words, if males fight over access to a female, that's intrasexual selection. If females compete for the attention of a male, that's intrasexual selection. The other term is intersexual selection. This is competition between the sexes. This is the fact that possibly, from an evolutionary standpoint, the sexes may have slightly different goals, slightly different objectives. Okay, and that seem, might seem a little abstract, but we'll, I'll get I'll get into that. That that's actually where things get really interesting. Actually, the whole realm of it's interesting. So sexual selection, the way as Darwin envisioned, or Darwin defined it as separate, was that it was specifically selection for characteristics, meaning physical traits or behaviors, that led to an improved mating success for the individual. Okay? Um, and so this is, this this kind of concept is really, it seems like, well, that's just natural selection. But it, it, 
it would seem so, and it would arguably be just natural selection, but then you start to find a conflict. And this is one of the things Darwin, Darwin's example of the peacock tail um, sums it up wonderfully, and I'll, I'm going to try to get that to you. Um, peacocks. The male has a long, beautiful tail, right? The male peacock has. The female doesn't. That tail is displayed, you know, you see him walking around, displaying that tail to the female, and it's been found in artif some artificial studies that, that, for example, the eyes, you know, the number and brightness of those eyes um, are determining factors as to whether or not a female peacock chooses to mate with the male. So this display, if the male has a crappy display, has a short, crappy tail, uh, very few, uh, whatever it is, he will not pass on those genes to the next generation. The males with the best tails, which is almost a fixed thing in this population, meaning that all peacocks have a pretty similar tail, and I'll get to that too. Um, in other words, the nice tail translates to reproductive success, right? Um, but So the reason that Darwin saw this as in conflict with natural selection, you might say that's just natural selection at work. Natural selection crafted the male into this, you know, whatever, pretty machine sex thing. Um, but what Darwin saw is that the tail is actually detrimental. Um, this means that when predation is occurring, um, things like dogs kill peacocks, things like that, um, males survive significantly less than females do. Why? Because this tail makes it hard for them to fly. Okay. Um, that large, that beautiful tail that so makes them so successfully during the mating season makes their lives difficult during the non-mating season. Um, if you were to, if there were no selection for sex, meaning that if females were to just mate with any male randomly, Darwin envisioned that natural selection would eliminate this tail. Those individuals with a long tail would get eaten more often. Those individuals with shorter tails, more manageable, normal tails, would survive more often. Pretty soon, males would no longer have that beautiful display. However, the reality is, so he saw natural selection butting up against sexual selection, and the two butting heads with each other, um, sexual selection going as far as it could, stating that the, the, the peacock's tail is as long as it can be any longer meaning the females selected tails think back to history a little bit longer a little bit longer the long every male that had a mutation with a longer tail was that much more attractive to the females until finally it hit a point where the tail is as long as it can get okay any longer than that and he can't fly any longer than that and suddenly there's He's not just handicapped in getting away from predators. He cannot get away from predators. So that that trait is eliminated. So I hope this kind of makes sense. So Darwin saw these as two different kinds of selection related to each other, sometimes complementary to each other, and ultimately complementary to each other, but in actual details um, at odds, often at odds, where the um, you know he looked at the songs of male birds, he looked at the bright plumage or the bright colors that you see in males. He looked at the fact that males often fight to severe injury or death with each other. Um, detrimental survival characteristics um, as a um, evidence that, not, that sexual selection and natural selection are two separate things. I'm going to continue this in uh, n another part, so uh, at least one more part, because I think this is, this, these concepts are really important to cover, so...